Welcome to the 2017, Fall 2017 Higher Leadership Talk. My name is Ajo Kennedy. I'm a professor and also serve as Associate Chair for Global Leadership Education and Research here in the school. And it's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker this morning. Uh, but before I do so, I want to take a moment to acknowledge our sponsors. Uh, the Hyatt Leadership Talk brings engineers who lead in global environments to talk to us and interact with us. And it is made possible by the general support of Ken Hyatt, who is a, uh, an alum, as well as MBP. Is MBP here today? Josh Rowan and MBP. So they are not here, but I want us to give them a warm round of applause. And after the talk, we're going to have a luncheon on the courtyard. So if we invite all of you to join us if you can. All right, so I'm going to go on and introduce our distinguished speaker, Andy Phelps. Andy Phelps retired in July 2017 after a 40 plus year career with Bechtel. His most recent role was principal vice president and global manager of operations for Bechtel's mining and metals business where he oversaw the design and construction of five copper concentrators, three aluminum smelters, one alumina refinery, one bauxite mine, one potash mine, and the world's second largest desalination plant. Andy is an eight-time project manager and five-time operations manager overseeing more than a dozen mega projects, mega projects, projects billion dollars or more on five continents. Prior to working in mining, Andy led several projects and was instrumental in a number of organizational transitions, including the restructuring of the British nuclear industry for the British government, restructuring of the Oak Ridge and Los Alamos complexes under contract to the US Department of Energy, Mississippi's response to Hurricane Katrina, and Saudi Arabia's response to the Arabian Gulf oil spill during Gulf War I. He led a number of environmental remediation projects, including FMC's Elemental Phosphorus Facility in Pocatello, ID, and Chevron's Ortho Chemical Plant in Richmond, California. He was a White House Fellow through the President's Commission on Executive Exchange during the George Herbert Walker Bush administration. He is a registered professional engineer in California and Tennessee and a board certified environmental engineer. He holds a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from Georgia Tech. And he completed postgraduate studies at Harvard Kennedy School of Government and the University of Tennessee. He has several honors. He was honored in 2015 by the American Society of Civil Engineers with their highest recognition, Opal Lifetime Achievement Award. He was elected honor member of Chi Epsilon at the University of Tennessee for his contributions to the college. And he recently completed a six-year role on the Academic Advisory Board for Civil and Environmental Engineering at Georgia Tech. Thank you. Thank you. And he's married to Barbara Phelps. They have two sons, <laughs> Edward, an assistant professor of biomedical engineering at the University of Florida, and Michael, a control systems engineer working for Honeywell in Houston. The two boys and their partners are all graduates of Georgia Tech. Please join me in giving a warm yellow jacket welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me in the back? Good. If you don't, if I, if I ever get soft, just sort of raise your hand and I will try and, and speak louder. Um, what a recognition. What a, what a very nice introduction. I've, I've just had an incredible career. And... Um, I just feel very lucky at all the things I've gotten to do. I sometimes would be on a trip at a job and I'd sort of pinch myself saying, somebody's paying me to do this? I would do this for free. Um, probably my most favorite uh, business trip of my life was I was on a place on the Yorubamba River in a uh, small boat going several hundred kilometers up this river meeting with indigenous people, looking at some siting for uh, some major oil and gas development in a pipeline. And I'm getting to stay in these communities and villages with people that were effectively Stone Age. And 
I just kept pinching myself that entire trip. Most people looked at me like I was crazy because the hardship, the heat, the rain, the living in these communities that there was nothing. I couldn't believe how lucky I was. So thank you for that. And, and, and I guess my career is sort of, I've, I've gotten to go to from one fun thing to the next, and I've always looked at it that way. Congratulations to this department and to all of you. And I hope you know what I'm talking about. It's the being listed as the number two school in the nation for civil engineering and also for environmental engineering. That's huge. It's huge for me. It, it makes my degree worth so much more. It makes your degree worth so much more. It makes your recognition huge. And so everybody in this room has helped create that to happen. The professors that are here, um, the students that are here, your acting uh, chair, uh, who I had f fun dinner with last night. Congratulations. Um, it's really cool to be back on campus. As you heard, my two boys went here. My son's advisor is in the back corner, and uh, he's been an extraordinary friend to our family and to my son, who's now teaching at University of Florida. The nurturing this school gives people that graduate from here to help them on there is a professor in this department, Dr. Sowers, that did similar to me. And I didn't head the academic stream. In fact, I tried to talk Edward out of that, uh, Andres. But um, I went into Bechtel, a very large private company. And I always got help whenever I had a problem, whenever I couldn't solve something. I came back and people, people always were willing to help me. Um, Georgia Tech Special. Excuse me, I'm going to use notes. I'm old enough that I sometimes have to use notes to remember what I wanted to say. It's a special place. Now, sometimes when you're in the grind and somebody's pouring more stuff on top of you, you're just going, oh, don't tell me that. But it's special for a, a unique reason. It's not the facts they stuff in your head. It's not the things that you you learn about how to calculate this or calculate that. It's how you learn to solve problems. That's been a gift for me my entire career. I knew how to take a huge problem and break it into pieces and solve it. So if you leave with nothing more than that, and if you don't use your engineering, and a lot of people leave here and don't use their engineering, that skill will be with you the rest of your life and it's powerful, it was powerful for me. This morning, I'm gonna talk about a few things, but first I wanna see a show of hands. Who came here for the free lunch? <laughs> okay, who came here because they're getting credit? A Couple of you, I'm sure. Who came here to learn about the story about the lion? A few of you, it's not photoshopped. In fact, I kind of look at those lions as some of my project managers, and <laughs> you have to manage them kind of like a lion. And who came here to learn a little bit about leadership? Good. It's a complicated topic, but the principles are simple. It's the applying them that's hard. So I'll talk about four projects today. You're seeing a picture of one there, and that's one of those cool projects that when you get there, you pinch yourself. Um, I'll talk about the challenges those projects have. I'll talk about some of the skills needed to accomplish those jobs. The team behaviors that I look for in a team to do these jobs. And then I'll spend a bunch of my time talking about the top leadership circle skills that you're looking for. What does it take to do those jobs? These projects are remote. They've got tough weather, geology, health issues, security issues. They're a bet the company project. They run three to five billion dollars. Some of them are a bit more, some are a little bit less. But the companies bidding, that are asking us to build these for them, they're betting their bottom line to achieve this on schedule, on cost, and to deliver the product they expect to deliver, the quantity and the quality. Um, 
these projects often have an impact on the GDP of the country we were working in. Some three or four, one job, we were 16% of the GDP of the country. That's just almost mind-boggling. So you get a lot of pressure from the country about building there and how important that job is for them. Sometimes in the middle of these jobs, governments will change from somebody that's very strongly pro-business to somebody that's very strongly social-leaning, uh, and it causes turmoil. Um, these jobs last between 36 and 42 months. You build a multi-billion dollar business and then you disassemble it in that short period of time. So leadership is critical. Leadership of the team is critical. Uh, behaviors of the team are critical. So let me find the button. That job, there's another picture of it in, uh, not in the winter, is called Los Francis. It's, it's outside of Santiago, Chile. Um, it's at about 11,000 foot elevation. And if I put my finger up here, this bridge is at a tunnel mouth that goes back five kilometers to the mine. And the ore is, the primary grinding of the, or crushing of the ores happens at the mine. And it comes in big two meter belts across here on a conveyor to this storage pile. And then it's brought to this building here where we have mills that are, this room would fit inside of, 40 foot diameter mills to grind the ore to almost micron size. But there, we had to knock the, the, the shoulder off of that mountain to find enough space just to put the mill. Here are thickeners, and then we moved the ore in a slurry pipeline 65 kilometers away to a place called Las Tortolas. It's a copper concentrator, and we would float the copper off using basically soap and bubbles. Copper is hydrophobic, so it would attach to the bubble, and it would then come over the top, and you'd get about 35% copper. We're starting with about a half a percent copper. So some of the challenges on this job, one is in the middle of building it, I went through an 8.8 .8 earthquake. Does that mean anything to anybody? <laughs> Third largest earthquake in the world. My wife and I were on the 14th floor of our apartment in Santiago, and the swimming pool above us came through the roof. We thought we were on the Titanic. We got our parkas out, she got an umbrella out, she grabbed everything out of the safe, and we went down the stairs, took a while to get out. <clears throat> and I said, well, let's check into the Ritz for a while. We did, for four months. It was kind of <laughs> cold. This job took a heck of a shaking, and the country took a heck of a shaking. And some of you, I think, have been involved in some of the seismic stuff in Chile. Every bridge in the country was decertified. And you think about it, we're moving steel and big, big stuff up to this mountain. And so it had a massive impact to the project. And so those are the sort of challenges we were faced with. This job also had rock slides. The Andes are young and not terribly stable. We had avalanches and we had an economic earthquake. At the very beginning of this job, we faced the global economic crisis of 2008. So this slide sort of gives you a sense of the major commodities, and I don't know how to get rid of that thing. Do we just do that? No, I'm afraid to do that. <laughs> we'll, we'll work through it. Right underneath that, it says 170,000 cubic meters of concrete for this job. That would fill Grant Stadium up 80 feet. Just to give you a magnitude of the size of this job, um, 112 kilometers of pipeline, and uh, just, just an incredible job to kind of get my teeth cut on for doing copper. Three Georgia Tech grads worked on this job with me, and uh, they had a ball, and they're, and they're still with the company. We did good. Com the, the customer was happy. Las Bambas. Now we're going from something that I don't think of as extremely remote like Los Francis. Las Bambas is, is near Cusco. Um, well, that's relative. The, um, the, the job is uh, 140,000 ton per day copper concentrator. It's 
about twice the size of the job I just showed you. It's greenfield. It's in the middle of absolute almost nothing other than the Quechua people that live up there on the high plains. It's at 14,000 foot elevation. So it hurts to go there. And it hurts to work there. Um, to get a job like this going, to get there, you've got to sort of leapfrog your way in. We build pioneer camps that are just tiny, you know, just a few guys. Then they build the next pioneer camp that you get maybe 100 people in. And then you finish up. And we had 61 million craft hours on this job. The local community spoke Quechua. It's a very complicated language to learn. You, th you know, I, my son, my other son, went to Cusco, and he told me to learn Spanish. And I said, I, I got you there. They don't speak Spanish in Cusco. They speak Quechua. And I said, what are you really there for? And I think it was to drink beer, as any good Georgia Tech guy would do. Um, this crossed paths with some of the narco traffic, the former Sendero Luminoso type guys, the, the Tupac uh, people. So our guys were always anxious about security. And we had a very good security team. Um, getting there was hard. That's the road to get there. So it was only a few kilometers from Cusco. When I first started going there, it was about 10 hours. It's now about 8. And that is the road. 61 million hours of craft is how many craft hours. Over about a 30-month period, that means between 10 and 15,000 people on site working. You've got to house them, feed them, clothe them, uh, give them tools, train them, uh, keep them safe. But because of the rotations, you actually hire twice that many people. Every one of them goes over that road. My nightmare every night was having a bus go over one of those cliffs. That scared me to death. We put a state-of-the-art GPS system in. We escorted every bus in and out. And we tracked every single vehicle to A. Make, and, we had, and we had special rescue equipment on the path the whole way. There's no way we could fly them in and out. You I mean you saw the terrain. And so getting those people to and from the job safely, and I will tell you that we did that. We had no fatal accidents on that road at all. 61 million craft hours. The numbers of miles we drove was amazing. And we just, we just GPS logged everybody going in and out. The amount of earth there, 29 million cubic yards. That would cover the Georgia Tech campus 60 feet deep. So just again, another magnitude sort of. Um, two, three Georgia Tech guys were on this job with me. One started as the deputy project manager and finished as the closing project manager. The project controls manager has moved on and now is a deputy project manager on a job I'll talk about in a minute. And a young man from here by the name of Gabriel Vega, who is a structural engineer, a master student here, who did, did, is just doing wonderful. Third project, moving far south. Amron is in the very northern tip of Australia. You see pointing there, just, just south of Papua. And um, it's on the Weeper River. I've talked about these camps. That's a, that's a camp, one of these jobs. It looks more like a city in reality. Now, this city has to be fortified because they have cyclones that go over this area frequently and, you know, during a season of the year, just like the U.S. And so you'll get a Cat 3, Cat 4 type cyclone going over that. And the big ones, we have special facilities that are literally bolted into the ground. The guys can take shelter in. But all of this has to be able to handle a, a Cat 1, Cat 2 type facility. And that's just the camp. Um, I've got other pictures of the construction, and it's just getting started. It's a, it's a huge bauxite mine. Bauxite is the precursor to making aluminum, as some people say, aluminum. And I, if I say aluminum in the company I came from, I get, I get whacked because they're all British, it seems. Um, but uh, you can see the, the port for loading the ships. 
We have two roll-on, roll-off port facilities for bringing the craft and the, and the resources. There was a 40-kilometer sealed road. My first trip into there took me two days by plane and car. It's now a, it's now a, a one-plane trip because we charter people in, and it's a 20-minute ride, and everybody says, what was the big deal? Um, so again, pioneer camp to get there. Challenges with job, this job besides the weather is you think, well, gosh, look at those beautiful beaches. That's where I'm going to spend my weekend. Anybody know what a saltwater crocodile looks like? <laughs> Fifteen foot. Um, they're there. They're all over. They're not an endangered species up there. <laughs> we do everything we can to keep people from going in the water. We've had one guy fall in in an accident, and we treat it as a near-fatal accident, always because the, 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 the crocs up there are so prevalent. It's a scary, scary thing. Very sensitive environment. You can see that it's, 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 a, it's a single canopy jungle there. But we have to, that, that jungle burns every year, the, 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 the floor of the jungle, and creates this incredibly noxious smoke. So the guys have to live in that. There's, there's Japanese encephalitis. There's all sorts of mosquito-borne stuff. Australia has the nastiest snakes in the world, and they're there, I promise you, and spiders. And so we have to keep our guys safe from those things. So this is a bit of an unusual job, but um, it's a, a fascinating place to visit. Um, Altuila, my last job I'll talk about, and then we're going to talk about leadership. At one time, we had 150 crane booms on this job site. 150 crane booms, and I'm not talking about little tiny things. I'm talking about some big booms. Um, this is in Abu Dhabi, so some of you might say, well, that's not remote. Uh, Abu Dhabi is in the United Arab Emirates, and it is an amazing place. The resources there, the, the facilities to make stuff in that country are second to none. They're absolutely stunning. But every single person is imported. Craft and professionals alike. It, it, the, the Arab population in UAE is quite small, and they've leveraged this by the way they've built their laws and their regulations to have all these people come in at, at fairly low cost to build. So this is a facility that takes that bauxite and turns it into something called alumina, which is a white crystal. It's aluminum oxide. It's sometimes used for grinding, but it's mostly used for making the metal aluminum. It's the middle step of it. It's, in the mining business, probably the most complex plant that we build. You, you get to the bauxite and you put it in caustic soda, and it dissolves, kind of like sugar in water, and then you precipitate it out to a white, white crystal of the right purity and the white, right uh, structure, and then you, you calcine it to... to, to um, to strengthen it. This is a two million um, ton a year uh, alumina uh, refinery. It's one of the biggest in the world. It's got a capacity to double that. And it's uh, effectively on schedule and, and on budget. It's a, it's a massive, massive project. Um, the challenges on this job, bringing in everybody. At one time on this project, we had 32 languages that were spoken. It's the Tower of Babel. <laughs> Think about safety. Think about training those people. The craftsmen come from all over the world, and they're there, and they, and first thing is we, we my company and I, myself, I require my leadership team to go into the camps and eat meals in those camps, in those labor camps, because in the past, they have not always been what they should be. There's been some fires that have killed many, many people in those camps. They've been a form of almost slum, which is sad. We, we don't tolerate that. And so my guys are required to go out on a very regular basis, make sure the guys are being fed well, make sure that they're in an environment that's safe, healthy, and that is productive. Because if you don't get a good night's sleep, you're not going to work well. So that's one of the big problems. But how do you do safety in a job with 20, 30 languages? We use pictures. We use icons. 
and we teach everybody coming on site in their native language about the, the rules of the job, the safety of the job. All these jobs have world-class safety records. This is, this is breaking records around the world right now for its safety. That doesn't happen by accident. It happens through strong leadership and strong um, training to make sure everybody understands what we want and how to be safe. Because the safety culture in many of these places is not naturally what you, you would get. Other challenges on Tawila. Anybody here ever worked in 50 degrees C? That's an amazing temperature. It's, it, you step out into that and that's, that's like in the 120 degrees. It is tough, it will eat you. And the humidity is just oppressive. So we don't work in the middle of the day. We work at night, but that requires another something. It means lighting the place up like a football stadium, except it's a little bit bigger. Um, there's two Georgia Tech grads on this job. The man that runs construction on this project, probably the smartest construction manager I've ever met in my career, is a mechanical engineer out of Georgia Tech. Uh, Nick, uh, Jed, uh, Jed Nick, sorry. Uh, Jed is just, just scary smart. The sequencing of this job is so important. Getting, it's like making lasagna, but with pipe and steel, and you gotta get it all in the right sequence, and you gotta build it in the right fashion, and you gotta get all the materials there at the right time. And then that young guy that came out of here, Gabriel Vega, is also on this job. He's moved from Santiago, Chile, to Las Bambas, and now he's in Abu Dhabi. And he's gone from being a on the board engineer to being a field engineer, and now he's the supervisor over the civil work. And it's wonderful to see him grow. So let's go on. I've talked about this stuff. Extreme environment, logistics, labor, sustainability, environment, security, government changes. I'm gonna move on so I don't overrun my time and put my real energy into um, leadership. These are the sorts of skills that are needed on one of these jobs. Project management, which is what I spent much of my career in. I was lucky I got there early. Site management, I mean, imagine you're basically a mayor of a town, but you own the whole town and you've got to feed everybody, clothe everybody. You've got to have hospitals there. You've got to have evacuation plans because people get sick when you have that many people. Uh, the engineering, and I have a challenge at the end of this talk for all of you on engineering. Construction, this is construction at, its, at the absolute edge of the business. Um, it's big, big stuff, big equipment, and you're doing it at the end of the earth. Uh, project control is legal. So those are all the skill sets. The technical team that does this work is between 300 and 800 professionals, depending on the size of the job. 300 and 800 for a craft team of between five and 15,000. So the leaders of this thing, this, this, these projects are leading something of that magnitude. So first I look at the team, and is the team healthy? When I fly into one of these jobs, I can usually feel it within almost, I say hours, but it almost, you're almost there mentally in minutes. And so I'm looking for these sorts of values in the team members. And you don't, a lot of these are innate to a human being, and so you hire people that are like that that share the honesty. Sadly, at some of these places, the ethics is not always in business what we would want. So we work really hard at that. I used to work with, 25 years ago, with the Odebrechts out of, out of Brazil. And sadly, what's happened there is, is it's decimated a country. And they've not only damaged their own country, but they've damaged Argentina and companies in, in, in Peru because of the issues there. So this is important, and getting that right. Safety, I, 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 you've heard me say safety probably 10 times today. If you hurt somebody, my view is we're being unethical. 
we need to make sure that we take care of our people. We've hurt somebody, we're, we're, we're damaging the whole reason we're there. We're, we're making these things to make the world better. And if we damage people in the process, shame on us. Um, diversity. You don't want people thinking the same. You don't want people that are just like me. And it's diversity in, in culture, it's diversity in backgrounds, it's diversity in experience, it's the big diversity. So, and those are the things I always want from the team on the far side, their actions. Getting stuff figured out soon and early. Once these jobs are moving, it's a freight train. Trying to change direction is really, really tough. So this is the team I'm looking for. And, and, and this is a busy slide, but this is supposed to be the meat of why we're here. In leadership, what's it take to lead a job like this? And I don't know if anybody in the room has any desire or vision to go do something like this. It's fun, it's scary, it's hard on your family. Um, my sons sometimes seem to be, have to be adopted by others to help them uh, get through school and whatnot because I was off chasing the, the world. But it's hard. The first thing I look for in leadership on one of these jobs is, is competence. I don't want somebody that's done it 10 times because they're usually pretty bored with the job and they should have moved on. If they haven't moved on, you sort of scratch your head and you say, why? I want somebody that's either just ready to move into it or has done it once or twice, but knows all those disciplines that we talked about earlier. They don't have to be experts, but they have to know the fundamentals to know when something's broken. They need to get there early on the job. You say, why? And that's to influence it, so they can put their stamp on it. You can't make cookie cutters out of these jobs. Um, they, leaders need to set goals that are achievable. Now think about what I said about the GDP impact on countries. Think about what I said about these companies are betting their company on it. There's huge pressure to squeeze the schedule and the cost of these jobs to get them over a hurdle. A job I won't mention the name of, it wasn't up here in Canada. A community was built in the 50s, purpose built, for um, making aluminum. And um, the, the, the facility had, was past its sell-by date. It was, it, was, it was obsolete. So they were trying to justify rebuilding a plant there. And I, I wasn't the operations manager. I was there early on, and, but I watched the squeezing going on, and they got it down to a silly number that passed the hurdles, and they sanctioned the job. Once one of these jobs goes, you go. You can't turn it off. Um, and as they got into the middle of the job, I got called in to look at it, and I just, I just wanted to cry because they had fooled themselves thinking that they were going to get the wind behind their back making this job happen. They assumed a schedule that was not possible. They assumed a cost that wasn't possible. And so my boss and I had to go sit down with the president of that company and say, this job is going to go up a billion dollars, a, a billion dollars. And he said, why didn't you come to me sooner? And I said, well, we did talk to your president. Sadly, she was removed. Well, maybe not sadly. But the pressure to squeeze these jobs is so immense. I'm looking for leaders that have the confidence and the fortitude to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with governments and with customers and stand for what's right and have the background to be able to hold the line on cost and schedule and to have an appropriate contingency for cost and schedule and that is funded. That's leadership. That's leadership of knowing that you may not have the job sanctioned, but you're doing the right thing. And you don't want to build a job that's always in trouble. I, I promise. I've been there. Um, these jobs aren't done by one person. If I go onto a job and I see a project manager with his hair just askew and just running here and there, I worry. I worry seriously. These are big teams. 
and these jobs are done by three to five to eight hundred people. And they're done by a team. They're not done by one person. You know, there's levels of leadership where you can lead a small team and you can do the lion's share of the work and it can survive. You know, that's sort of like the, what I call first tier of leadership. Then you start leading leaders. This is leading huge teams. The leaders need to be people that are looking for signs. They're looking for signals that there's issues. They're looking for those problems, anticipating them. They're looking for the health of their teams and their employees that are caring about those things and anticipating them. And they have to be really brave and they have to know when to ask for help. It's cheating the team if you have a problem and you don't raise it. You say, why, what do you mean? You know, real men sort of solve their own problems. You know, it's sort of a macho business. And no, the team needs a chance at it. And it's kind of like somebody hogging the ball in soccer or football. It's about sharing the problem, getting the team around it, getting the best minds you have on it. So it means having this open environment and talking about it. You heard me talk about it at the very beginning of the team. It's trust. I need to be able to walk into a customer and say, we're trending six months behind, six weeks behind schedule. What do you want to do about it? My advice is we should invest $100 million of our contingency into solving that problem. $100 million, that's a lot of money. And how do, you, how, do you, how do you have that conversation if the guy doesn't trust you and believe you? When the government comes to you and says, ah, they want to do something different, and you have to present what that happens to the net present value of that job, they've got to believe you. You've got to have trust because there's so many partners in this thing. One of the most important areas to build trust is with local communities. That job lost Bombas. We moved 1,200 families off that land into a, a village that we built, a stunning village, one that anybody in this room would love to live in, beautiful mountains. But in that process, creating the trust, creating that communication, when you don't even speak two or three words of their language is critical. Understanding their culture, understanding what's important to them, and, and, and is really, really, really important. So I look at my leaders, people that can exude that confidence, but not braggadocia. Um, delegating and empowering. There's a difference between delegating and empowering, huge difference. Empowering means you trust the person to make a decision. Being decisive. These jobs are moving a gazillion miles an hour. The project manager is not always on site. He has to rotate. Those altitude jobs, you're going to spend 21 days there, and then you're out. So you've got a deputy that you've delegated to, and you've got to have some downtime because you, when you're up there, you, I mean, you're sleeping seven or eight hours a night, and even then you're getting poor sleep because of the hypoxia you feel from the altitude. How do you build a team so that you can do that? You've got to trust your team. And that's just probably one of the most important things that you can do. Um, you will have incidents that happen on the job. Um, in my career, I've had four fatalities that I've had to deal with. I wear every one of them on my heart. Every one of them I went to the family and had to break the news. There's nothing harder you've ever done in your life than go to a wife and a family and be the person to tell her that her husband was killed on your job, and it's your responsibility. Um, my driver that brought me back from Las Bambas on his way back it was in a horrific car accident. And um, I'd already flown out. And I'd landed at the airport, and I called my wife, and she says, the world's calling you. I got back on that same flight and flew back in and went to their home in a small little community in, in, in Peru. And uh, 
what a, what a horrible thing to do. I do everything in my life I can to avoid that. Every single accident on one of these jobs where somebody is not injured or seriously hurt, we use as a gift. And you get other gifts like that, and you use that gift, and you just wring out of that every possible learning as to what did we not do that caused that. We bring experts in. On one of those accidents, we'll spend $100,000, $200,000 in resource to come in and just really understand it. Because what we find is that investment in our people and keeping them safe gives them the confidence to do more work, to become more productive. But it also is the right thing to do. Um, this is hard work. When I met my wife in San Diego 42 years ago, she said, what do you want to do in your life? And I said, I want to build big stuff. <laughs> And she said, OK. And I, she says, what's that mean? And I said, I want to go all over the world and build things that make the world better for people. And she said, cool. And I said, um, we've only been on three or four dates. And she said, yeah. And I said, well, I kind of like you. <laughs> and I said, but what do you think? Would you like a guy that that's what they did for a living? And she says, that sounds really fun. She sort of ran away from Indiana to go to Berkeley. Um, and said, I, she had the same vision. I said, I'll be gone a whole lot. Is that OK? And we built a partnership. And we will have our 40th wedding anniversary in June this year coming. And um, she's been part of why I've been able to do this. And I look for other people that have relationships that are similar. Because whether you're a man or a woman, going off and doing these jobs is hard. You're separated from your family for periods of time. Last year, my wife on Thanksgiving looked at me and said, I'll be a little risque, do you know we've slept together in 45 days this year? And I said, in the carnal way? And she says, no, you were too tired. <laughs> It made me realize maybe I had broken the balance a little bit, and that part is what kind of, I was getting ready to retire anyway, but kind of pushed me there a little bit. But caring for your family, keeping that balance is hard. I hate to say it, some guys in this business have gone through a few marriages, but the guys and the ladies, I had a, I had a on that job I was talking about in Canada, the woman, woman I brought in to go run that job after it, it broke, um, had a young family, including a, a special needs child. And she, she was an amazing leader. All those attributes I'm talking about there. She wasn't a Georgia Tech grad. That's the only fault she had. <laughs> but it's th that human piece. And something I try and teach the teams is all of us have times that we have needs. Our families have needs. And we need to be respectful of that, and we need to pe help people go take those breaks. I had a PM in, in uh, the Middle East that needed to go get a kidney, and he wasn't going to go get it because he so much loved his job. I said, you're killing yourself. And I said, I'll give you a choice. I will either fire you, or I'll give you a three-month leave of absence to go take a break. But I need to bring somebody else in, because I, I cannot have my conscience that you didn't go get a new kidney because you're so in love with your job. You can imagine. That's how attractive this work is, how fun this work is. Um, some of us have a dinner tonight. We'll have some time out here. But we'll talk about leadership some more. It's a, it's a, it's a complicated, squishy topic. It's not like engineering, where you've got an equation to solve it. It's that soft side that's so, so important in what we do. Um, I'm going to shift gears, and I'm going to leave you guys w with a challenge. Who knows what's happened to productivity in engineering and construction over the last five, 
decades in the world. Anybody? Actually, productivity is the only industry where productivity has gone backwards. Most industries have seen a 3 or 5% gain in productivity per year. So we're talking about, if you look at it, there's an article in, um, in um, Economist in August that was done by McKinsey that uh, speaks to construction and construction productivity in the U.S. and the world. It's gone backwards. I mean, if you look at the automobile industry, the number of hours it takes to make a car is like it's almost not believable. Our industry has gone backwards. Um, major companies like the one I worked for are moving huge numbers of engineering jobs offshore. I'm talking about millions of hours of engineering. And so my first challenge to this university uh, is to think about how do we use AI in engineering? I had a small team, five guys and two girls, in Australia that could design a complex mechanical, electrical, structural conveyor system that was many kilometers long down to the detailing of it in less than a day including specifying the materials out of catalogs of what was already built. And I'm talking about big, complex conveyors for the mining business. You know, one, two meter belt type things. These are motors half the size of this room. Done using, I'm not smart enough to even know what AI is, but what I call AI, using technology. Designing it to be constructed quickly with good connections. And that's my second piece. I think these things are married. I'm worried about the US. I'm worried about all developing nations and what's happening with leadership in engineering. I grew up out of the engineering business. That's where I got my start, and I became a leader of projects. Um, this work is moving to places where it's, you know, to India, to, to, to Taiwan, and they're doing great work. And it's great for those countries. But I also worry about robbing some of those brains that should be helping with some of the infrastructure in those, in those countries. If you've gone to India, you know they desperately need some infrastructure help uh, to change the country. The transportation gridlock there is immense and tough. And so I worry about this topic. But I also worry about how diffuse engineering has become and how many thousands and thousands of people you have working on it. So my challenge is to think about how do we do that smarter? How do we bring computers in to allow us to squish this down? Nearly every job I've ever had that's had a challenge or a trouble is because engineering is late. And whether it's a vendor engineering a machine or whether it's the structural type engineering of the plant, it's a big issue. So if we can find a way to do that differently, it's empirical stuff. I don't understand why we can't design machines to help us do that. Construction productivity is going to be harder. It's a massive problem. It's impacting our ability to improve the infrastructure in this country because of the cost of construction. And so, those two things, we're, we're absolutely out of cycle with the rest of, the industry, of all the other industries. So I'd urge you to go read about it. Look at what um, was in the Economist article uh, this uh, past August. It's real. So with that, we've got some time for questions, and we've got lots of time outside, but I'll take as many questions. And we can talk about you have any question you want except about my sex life. Questions? First of all, I just want to thank you for coming here. I always like coming to these kinds of events because like, I always feel like there's room for like learning more about leadership. Um, my question is, I was reading your bio a few days ago, and I saw that um, your postgraduate studies, you went to like the Kennedy School of Government. So like, how would you rate the importance of like, seeking 
postgraduate studies that aren't exactly like masters in civil engineering and like how does that play in in your role with like back then? I, th I think you need to decide what you want to be. And, and like I knew what I wanted to be was to build big things and I wanted to lead those projects. And so my technical training was very useful to understand the projects, but I needed some skills that were softer. Um, I went through Kennedy as part of the White House fellowship I was involved with. And so we, we, we got training in economics. And so you think about, oh, you know, what's a GDP? And, you know, you, we all sort of kind of know what a GDP is, but to have somebody, you know, from Harvard kind of crack it into your brain, you really learn the importance of it. And you do case studies. Uh, and, and so it depends on where you want to go and what you want to do. Um, but I really believe never stop educating yourself. Never stop participating in, in getting and, and following the, the information you need to further your career, whatever it is. And so there's not a pat answer to go get an MBA or go get a master's or a PhD. My son wanted to go become a PhD, my eldest, and he's done it and he's having fun and he's doing stuff I can't even begin to understand. Um, my other boy has gone off to Honeywell. He's more like me and he's now working on his PE. Uh, he's five years out of school. He's worked in Australia, in Canada, in Peru, in Chile, and and he's he's kind of it's kind of fascinating. And he's asking me the same question: Dad, should I go get a master's? And I said, What do you need to pursue your dream? Does that help? Another question. It's a good question. So I'm um, a mechanical engineer, senior. Uh, I'm studying mechanical engineering and uh, I'm also a senior right now, but um, the work that I've done, well, because I was in the military and then I, my job was pretty much manager, like management, and then I was really interested in the management, but considering I'm senior and I'm also studying mechanical engineering right now, um, I'm kind of like like in the some sort of like trap that like, uh, since you are, you study engineering also, you also study engineering and then um, you went to some sort of, I would say, management path. Um, what do you think that um, the basic knowledge of engineering helped to uh, the boost your management area or career? Sure. Without, without question. Um, I couldn't have done what I did without technical skills. My credibility. Um, I mean, one of the most embarrassing things I ever did in my life was I designed something and then I went to the field to build it. And I realized that I needed to learn some more about engineering. But you, you need a foundation and a credibility. And a, and a, and a, and a career is not just a, like a, a vertical peg. It's a, it's, a, it's a pyramid and you've got to build that foundation. And don't be too impatient. I, I know you feel like maybe I, well, I went backwards, I was managing, and now I'm doing engineering, and what do I do with it? I, th I think it's very powerful that you've gotten the engineering degree and that technical skills, and you need to practice it some. Get your PE. Everybody in here, get your PE. It's your stamp of who you are as a professional. But then build those two things together to find the next thing, and it may require some more education. But, but the technical foundation that you're gaining is, is huge. And it will, it will help you no matter what you do because you'll understand how things work. And that's powerful. That's really powerful. I, I'm happy to talk to you some more. There was another question in, in the back. Okay, is it, is it a quick question? We have a class coming in. Ah. So what I'm going to suggest is if you don't mind, we can continue the questions um, outside. But, Please hold on a second. We, we want to first of all thank Andy for his wonderful lecture. Please join me. <laughs> and we have Donald Smith, who is in our Global Engineering Leadership Minor, to uh, do a, a presentation. All right, thank you again to Mr. Andy Phelps. So, out of appreciation, 
from the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering for coming in and opening his mind to all of us and sharing his experience and wealth of wisdom. We would just like to present to you this small gift for all you've done for the school. So thank you. Thank you.